Tandem Nomads, episode 210. Adolescence is such an exciting time of transformation. And my goal as a pediatrician and teen health specialist is to help them with that period of time, not only with the changes physically and emotionally, but also culturally and helping them to thrive and to become successful adults. Hello, Nomad Nation. Welcome to Tandem Nomads, the podcast show and entrepreneurship platform where you can find great inspiration to grow a successful portable business and thrive in your global nomadic life. This is your host, Emel Deregi. I'm a business and marketing coach and the founder of Tandem Nomads. Today, I want to share with you an inspiring story that will hopefully get you to connect with your big why, as well as get some practical tips of how to turn that big why into reality. And to talk about that, I am really excited to welcome you, Anisha. Anisha Abraham, are you ready for this ride? I am very excited. Thank you for having me. My pleasure. So Nomad Nation, Dr. Anisha Abraham is a pediatrician and teen health with 25 years of global experience. She's currently based in Washington, D.C., and is on faculty at the Children's National Hospital and Georgetown University Hospital in Washington. Anisha grew up in the United States as the daughter of South Asian immigrants and has lived with her husband and two kids in Asia, Europe, and the U.S. over the last 10 years. Anisha treats and counsels young people with a variety of issues, including social media use, drug use, and stress. As a recognized educator, Anisha provides training on adolescent health and wellness to faculty, teens, and parents. And the one big reason that I also wanted Anisha to come here is because she has also launched and wrote a book called Raising Global Teens. And Anisha, we have met two years ago at a conference in Bangkok, and I have heard you talk about your passion to support global teens, and we will talk about it today. But before we get into it, could you tell us... um, yeah, actually, what got you to write this book? Well, thank you again for having me and being able to talk about uh, my uh, adventure, my journey um, on this uh, show. And I'll just say that um, more and more that we have young people that are considered cross-cultural, which means that um, they are like me and have had parents that um, uh, perhaps grew up in another country and then moved. Um, so my parents were immigrants from South India, um, but we also have young people that have parents that are from different backgrounds, like my husband and myself. My husband's German. I'm Indian American. So we have very different cultures between us. And we also have young people that are moving from place to place. Um, I was a military physician for a long time. I've also uh, lived in three different continents and have taken care of young people um, that are having this experience of moving from community to community or country to country. Um, and so we are having more children and teenagers that are exposed to more than one culture in their daily life. And um, there are some wonderful strengths that come with this, tolerance and a worldview, adaptability, language. But there can be some challenges. That includes, again, um, grief and loss and this whole question of identity and who I am, who am I? And I wrote this book because um, I felt that there's so many issues that our young people right now are dealing with. Um, related to adolescence and those questions about their physical and sexual and also cultural identity. And on top of that, of course, we have um, this whole issue of a pandemic and all mm. of what a pandemic brings to it. Um, but I really wanted to provide very um, specific tips um, and strategies for young people and their families, again, thinking through the lens of having that cross-cultural experience and what that adds um, in terms of going through adolescence. So I will, I'm sure, be talking more about, uh, again, yeah. this book and what it means, but I think that's a little bit of the background um, for me as to why I wrote this. And again, using a lot of my own experiences uh, as a teenager growing up with immigrant parents again, being a physician and also being a parent and, and living through this. That's amazing. So yeah, I want to unpack this because there's so much great gems into your your journey and your story through this book, but also even before and I think after, there's a lot more <laughs> waiting for you. Um, but you know, I was... Um, I was listening to your TEDx, actually, Nomad Nation. I will put the link to Anisha's TEDx talk. I realized that, in fact, actually, the, the your book could be helpful to any parent, I have the feeling. But there's one thing that global nomads and global parents and expat parents struggle with on top of how complex it is to raise teens, 
it is that global lifestyle and that identity crisis that comes when changing all the time of, of locations and, and, and also social groups and communities. Uh, so I think that is really important. That's why I think I was also attracted to, to your message through your book. Um, another thing as well that attracted me to your journey, uh, you have as well moved on a regular basis as a mom, but also as a professional. I was wondering, how did you manage your career as a physician while moving from a country to another? That is a wonderful question. And I will say that the best professional advice that I ever received as I was about to move from uh, Washington DC and academia, and I had a three month old and an 18 month old, and we were about to leave from DC to go to Hong Kong is that our professional lives are not linear like a ladder, but they're more like a jungle gym. And there are many different ways to the top. And I'm very happy to say that it, that's indeed the case for me when I think about my professional journey, uh, that there are so many opportunities for us sometimes to advance, um, but we need to be open to those opportunities and not realize and not think that our careers are in one particular kind of road or pathway. <clears throat> and I will say that um, moving abroad uh, forced me in some ways to think out of the box. Um, I wasn't in a traditional academic career. When I moved to Hong Kong, for example, they didn't have teen health and many of the things that I was doing in my academic work in Washington, D.C., but it gave me the opportunity to actually work in global public health and to start to take teams of young people to developing countries and to start thinking about more of the issues related to young people that were living outside of their own home country and how to support them. So it brought all these other opportunities as well. And again, coming back to your question, I think I had to knock on many doors um, in each place that I was in to really see how I could use my skill sets um, in, in a very thoughtful way because it wasn't sometimes what I would have naturally would have wanted to do with my, my, my skills. But having moved from then from Hong Kong to the Netherlands, again, it gave me the opportunity to write this book actually, among other things. Um, so I think that um, I had to do a lot of, uh, again, exploration, uh, talking to people about what was available, sometimes creating my own um, path in, in those places using what I had, um, being an ambassador, I think in many places for adolescent health is what really helped me, but it's not easy. And I'm sure we'll talk about this more. And yeah. there were many times where I also just questioned why I was moving and why I was doing this. And wouldn't this just have been easier had I never moved in the first place? Yeah. Okay. There's so much important <laughs> things that you're saying here. My God, I, I'm like, where should I start right now? Because, <laughs> okay, I want to start with one thing. I have, I want to make a big shout out to uh, all the women, especially, but especially in expat partners who have built a career in a certain uh, industry where you kind of have a title and a degree that is not easy to replicate in other countries. I'm talking about like you doctors, lawyers, and you'll tell me, Anisha, if I'm wrong, but I feel like even more than, I remember as a advertiser, I didn't have that title, but it was right. a huge part of my identity, my right. corporate career. So what do you want to share with those who have that worked and studied years to get those credentials to be able to live their dream jobs and suddenly have to give up on that sort of identity? I don't know if you experienced that and if you want to share anything about that. Yes, and I'm, I'm sure I could speak for a very long time about this topic alone, <laughs> but just to say that um, when you do have a career or a profession that you've worked in, and I had worked in uh, medicine for many years before we moved, um, I, I knew very strongly, and this is certainly the advice I give to others, uh, you've worked so hard to develop this and to have this identity that you need to continue this. This is so important to you. And I, I feel that I'm, I'm very proud that I was able to continue my career, although it was in a slightly different um, way than I initially thought, but I didn't ever wanna give it up. And I think that's my biggest advice to anyone that is a professional that has a career is that you can continue to keep working. Don't give up on those hopes and dreams. You've gone through so much education. You've gone through so much in your life to, to build that in the first place. Um, I think my other advice is also to realize that um, there are many ways that you can still uh, have a career 
Um, and it might be considered non-traditional, but you can still continue to have that and have fulfillment. And sometimes it makes, um, when you look back at that journey, even richer in terms of all of the assets and skills that you've developed as a result of it. So I would say that you need to think broadly when you're mm -hmm. going out into new places, that there may not be the, the natural opportunities that you think you have. I always thought I would just be able to work uh, just doing teaching and clinic and research. But as a physician, for example, when you move to another country, suddenly there's a language issue. When I moved to Hong Kong, the medical system of the hospitals was in English, but the patient spoke Cantonese. And you know, just moving there, I wasn't proficient in Cantonese, so I had to have an interpreter. Um, so there was all these things I had to do to work around it. When I moved to the Netherlands, uh, licensing was more of a challenge. But in addition to that, all the patients spoke beautiful English, but the system of the hospital was in Dutch. And so you just realize that there can be these hiccups and challenges, even though you are a professional in your own right and have a lot of skill sets. And so whether it's language or other issues, you need to think about what else you can do with those abilities and how else you can um, give um, and develop. So when I moved to the Netherlands, for example, I worked a lot in, in terms of developing adolescent health at in the community, in the university community that I was in, because that was something I felt very comfortable with. And that was not something that they actually had built up yet. Um, but I wasn't able to do patient care in the ways that I had always done in the past because of the language limitations. And so I had to be creative about using my skills and my passions in different ways. And like I said, it turned out to be the one a, a wonderful opportunity for me to start writing a book um, that I had already done a TEDx talk on and had been encouraged to write about that I then was able to use that time also in the Netherlands to start to really write this book and to get it out into the world. I love it. I love it. Okay, so Nomad Nation, I hope you listen to this once more. If you are in that situation, there's a lot of little jams in here. But I do think that, you know, that thinking outside the box and also realizing that you're not giving up on your identity because you're not doing exactly the career the way traditionally you thought you would do it but you can practice your skills in so many different ways like you said Absolutely. through your community in the university and eventually then the book so let's go into this uh, amazing venture I have, how long ago did you write this book it was just published in october so it's very recent October 2020. <laughs> so we're yes. at the beginning of 21 when we record this episode. It's very recent. And since then, I was so impressed with how you handled your PR. And I would love to hear some of the tips, what has helped you. But before we talk about that, I kind of imagine that you were still very busy in the Netherlands. And let's not forget, you're also an expat mom and everything. I it's already hard enough to write a book, but on top of it, with the complexity of everything happening, I'm just wondering what did you have to put in place from the moment you want you had the idea to the moment you decided to sit down and start writing the first page? That's a wonderful question. And I have to say, my first response is you need to believe in yourself. And as I mentioned, I had done a TEDx talk a few years ago and someone approached me and said, this would be a wonderful idea for a book. And I replied, well, I've written research studies before and I've done short pieces for newspapers, but I've never written a book before. I'm not an author, I, I, I really can't do this. And it was actually my husband, um, and certainly a, a number of very close friends that said, you know what, you, you could really do this. You could write it because you're very good at translating concepts for a lay audience and communicating. And you can communicate verbally, but you also can communicate through you know, the written language. And this is something you're really capable of. And so I think, first of all, just having the confidence that you can sometimes deliver something is really important to getting over that hump. And many times, particularly as women, we doubt ourselves and we doubt our abilities and we think we, we just can't do it. So so um, I think for me, it was very helpful to have a team of people that believed in me that were my cheerleaders that kept kind of pushing me on and supporting me in this very new adventure. I, I, I again, I felt very well defined in my, my medical career, but not so well defined in my writing and literary career. Um, what also very much helped me as I was thinking about writing a book is that I joined a writing group. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, for some of us that require structure and discipline and reminders, it's very useful to join groups that actually make you accountable. Um, and I have friends that are physicians that get up every day at four o'clock in the morning and they write, you know, 20 pages. I'm just not that kind of person. I, I do other things, but to do that was a little bit hard for me. So a writing group, and I was part of one for several years, helped me to get the idea of this book across, helped me to start to find my voice and my audience. 
um, and gave me a lot of sometimes very tough feedback um, that allowed me to really take this off, to send it out to several publishers, to get a publisher and to move it on. So I think finding some type of an audience or a group or a focus group when you have projects or ideas like this is really important. The other thing that helped me is I started, I became a consultant while I was in the Netherlands as one of my many hats that I kind of um, carried and started to work uh, with schools and organizations and started to do more in terms of teen health and educating young people and uh, parents. And I created a website and a newsletter and started writing blogs about different articles. And so writing those blogs in some way helped me to start to again, develop ideas and develop um, my voice even more. And a lot of that material I could then kind of curate and compile as I was putting together my book. Um, so it was a, a, a bit of a testing ground for some of, uh, again, later content for my book was many of those blogs that I wrote. Uh, the final piece that I would say is I um, had the wonderful opportunity of meeting Joe Parfit, um, who's part of Summertime Publishing through uh, uh, Families of Global Transition. And she was really instrumental in terms of helping me to uh, really move this book along and of course get it published. And one of the first things I asked her to do was to give me deadlines. I said, I work with deadlines and if you can give me a monthly deadline to get a chapter done, I will try my best to do it, but I need someone to sit on me and make sure that this happens. And that's literally how this book kind of came together is that I had these regular deadlines. I, in addition to my writing group that was giving me feedback, had an editor that was ensuring that I got this material out. So that's a bit of, again, what helped me to write this book. I love that. It starts with determination, believing yourself. And then what you've done is surround yourself with the right people. And that I think takes courage and, and, and also being humble to say, okay, I need support to get this done and bring this to reality. Uh, and, and thank you for sharing all those resources. I also highly recommend Joe Parfit, who has been one of the people who has inspired me to consider writing a book. So we'll see. Uh, <laughs> so, um, okay, so this is really good, Nomad Nation. I hope that if you're in that situation, you can get a lot of insights from here and get started somewhere, right? And, and at some point, commit, just commit to not just yourself, but to somebody else who gives you, who keeps you accountable. I think that's really important. So once you have written the book, um, how did you manage to start? What did you do to then start putting it out there? And can you tell us first, I think it would be good to have a snapshot of what do I mean when I said you did a great job with PR? Maybe you can share with us all the places you've been featured. And, uh, and then later we'll see, how did you manage to do that? Well, I, I'm excited to say that um, the book came out in October and I have been interviewed in probably 50 different media outlets around the world to include CNN and um, uh, NPR, um, South China Morning Post, the Dutch uh, newspaper, um, ABC, NBC, most of the major uh, news outlets um, in the US. Uh, and I'm now starting to write a little bit more regularly for the Washington Post. That's so amazing. there's um, a, a lot of media opportunities that, that were really wonderful. In addition to that, I was able to do 17 different virtual launch events in different uh, countries and communities. And part of this is um, because of the pandemic. I had initially envisioned this wonderful tour of going to different countries and seeing all of my friends and you know, having these experiences physically. And then because of the pandemic, I had to do a, a huge reset and um, in fact had to do these virtually, but in some ways it opened the possibilities um, much more. And I was able to reach out and to do these book chats and discussions about content and answering parents' questions uh, in, in a very different way. And that also ended up being um, a very exciting experience. So these are some of the things that have happened as a result of this book coming out. I love it. This is amazing. So I, I want to dig deeper into the content of your book, but yes. before... Could you tell us some of the tips for those who are in that situation? I have so many people in the audience who are writing their books and just so worried about who's actually going to buy it and who's going to be interested in even featuring them. So what are the things you did that worked for you to be able to get featured in such amazing uh, media outlets? Well, I, I think that the short answer is you need to start well ahead of the time that your book actually comes out to ensure that this goes out into the broader community. and. Um, 
probably the best advice I received about my book is you only have this one shot. So might as well get it out into many places as possible and make sure that it um, really gets um, the most reach. And I think that's true. I mean, there may be other people that are listening that are going to have several books, but I'm not quite sure when my next book is coming out. (laughs) So I thought, you know, that's true. I might as well put my best effort into getting this book out as broadly as possible. I will also say that um, my efforts in marketing started nearly a year before, if if not, you know, even more than a year before the book actually came out. And I think many people think uh, the work for marketing only happens once your book is published Mm -hmm. and almost say that's too late. So for me, that meant um, having this website, uh, starting to do a monthly blog and a newsletter, which created reach around the world. I started to have parents that were on this monthly newsletter that were actually getting my information that were excited and starting to talk about my book and what would come out and little teasers about the book and why this book would be interesting um, was part of what I was doing through my newsletter and certainly through my blog. In addition to that, I was doing a lot of speaking in many parts of the world. And um, some of those were, of course, free. Actually, quite a lot of this was free. And um, during the pandemic, when the pandemic hit, I found that there was an incredible need for information related to mental health and supporting Mm. families. And I found that this was also a really important time for me as a pediatrician to provide, again, free information uh, to the community and to do talks. But as a result of doing these talks, I would always say, well, I have this book that's also coming out, but I'd love to reconnect with you and talk to you more about this when it does come out. So um, my advice to anyone that's listening is using different ways to connect with your broader audience. And sometimes we'll have to do those free and, and that's part of what you need to do, but it helps for people to know who you are and why they should be listening to you when you finally do have a book that comes out. I also realize that many of us are busy and as a parent and as a physician, I don't think I had the bandwidth for all of this. So I very quickly brought on people um, to help me. Initially, they were, um, you know, my babysitter and, you know, (laughs) someone that was a friend that happened to do communications that I would ask them just to give me a couple of hours during the week just to um, help me to get my newsletter out and just to make sure that it was edited okay, even though I created the content or just to check on my website and to update things if need be because it's sometimes hard to do all of that. So I would also recommend for anyone that's listening to make sure that you tap into other people to help you. And it doesn't have to be, you know, hiring at the highest level, but sometimes there's someone that has a little bit more of these skill sets or otherwise find an, a millennial, but mm-hmm. someone that has the skill sets um, that will help you for a few hours if you need yeah. per week just to get that information or help you with your social media or help you with other things. I will also say that I started to become much more active than I've ever been in my entire life on social media platforms. I'd never had an Instagram account until a year ago. I became much more active on LinkedIn and of course um, have been posting from time to time on Facebook. And I think using all of these um modalities are really important to connect. And then the final piece that did really help me when it comes specifically to uh, TV and radio um, was that I did uh, have a PR firm in Washington, DC that I hired probably two months before my book came out. And I think that is a very um, personal question as to whether or not you want to use a a PR and, and marketing company. Um, I think that they were very helpful in terms of getting my um, information out um, into broader markets. Uh, And again, it wasn't really just about the book. It was much more about topics related to young people, what was happening Mm -hmm. at the time that I was responding to. And that's where I was getting my interviews. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about depression, anxiety, how to handle the pandemic and young people? And oh, by the way, you're an author of this book. So if you want more resources, go back to this book. So I would also recommend for those that are thinking about this journey to consider having a a PR marketing company support them because they certainly also open up other opportunities for you to get into um, some of these, to get some of these interviews um, and to get, um, again, a a broader audience. Uh, And some of them may just do it for a month or two. Others will do it for several months. I think those are all things that you need to think about as you're working through um, how best to approach this. So those are my quick tips. Um, but it, it takes a village and you need to use all of your, you know, your friends, your network, your supports to do this. When I did my book tours, I tapped into all of my friends in different countries and communities 
to help me to do those book launches and to be the hosts and to be my moderators and interviewers and so on when I was doing these chats. So in each place, I created a community of people that were part of my global tour and were really supporting me and, and, and being ambassadors for this. And so again, just ideas for all of you that are thinking about this is tap back into your networks um, and get your message out um, when you have that chance. It is so, so good. So Nomad Nation, take notes, listen to this again. <laughs> and uh, you shared so much here um, that I would just love to unpack more, but because of time we can't. But I, uh, Nomad Nation, one thing to know on top of, I just want to highlight something important on a marketing perspective that yes. you've done is um, preparing the ground. Like, yes. as you said, you built an audience before and it went all the way to getting support for free and then at some point investing. And I think this is the range of what I've seen as a common thread between everybody who's been successful at launching a book or anything else, by the way, in business. So I think this is great. One thing is, did you have any hesitation to invest or any fears around that? And how did you overcome it? I, um, I think that, yes, there's always a little hesitancy in terms of paying money for any of this, but I do think in talking to others that were successful, and I, I would also recommend for those of you that are thinking about writing a book or launching anything, to really speak to folks that have been successful and have done this very well. And I had a number of physician friends that had you know, New York Times bestsellers, and I asked them, what did you do and what really made the difference? And I think over and over, I, I got the feedback you know, help get people that are professionals to help you with this if you're mm -hmm. going to do it, because they're going to have a much broader reach. Mm -hmm. And I will also just mention that very early on, I was, I was creating my website and thinking about how to be a consultant in this world. I also had someone that helped me with marketing mm -hmm. and um, thinking about my mission and my vision and, you know, that quick statement that you have. And so for folks that are a little earlier in all of this, um, having someone that can help them to think about these very important questions and to distill it into that elevator pitch or, you know, really mm -hmm. those two or three sentences that really encapsulates what you're doing is so useful. It's a great exercise. So I think investing a little bit really takes you much further. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing that. So Nomad Nation, I also want to add that we have two more episodes in Tandem Nomads that are like in different ways sharing this experience of how to prepare your audience and, and promote your book. So check them out on tandemnomads.com to dot com slash 210. Uh, I want to dive a little bit before we end this into the topic of the book. And one thing I loved before we jumped into this call, you know, we were discussing a little bit how to run this discussion. And you were telling me about that big why that really that's what motivates you the reason why you right. did the book and, and it's more than just about the money or the expertise or the visibility. It's really about that mission that you have. And I want to hear more about that mission. Why are you so passionate about helping teens and what is it that you want to share we have so many parents listening to this show uh, with those who have teens especially what is the message you want to share well I think my essential message is that uh, adolescence is again a challenging enough time and as they're having these changes that are happening both physically and emotionally, when you add on the cultural and identity piece that we have with cross-cultural kids, it can be a lot to be dealing with. And the more that we can support our young people as they're going through this, the more likely they are to do well as they become young adults and, and go on in their life journey. And um, I think my big kind of push with my book and so much of what I'm talking about is this idea of conversations create connections and connections are protective, particularly at this time where young people are really struggling with the pandemic and all that it means. And so my book is really meant to start conversations between young people and their parents or caregivers or other adults that are in their life and to make sure that there's continuous dialogue that's occurring. And that's mm -hmm. a lot of what I do when I'm speaking again to parents or teenagers is how do we start these conversations? How do we get information for the things that you're really curious about? Um, how do we make sure that we can support you in all the ways that you can? Yeah. So just to relate to those who might not yet have teens or are too young or might be parents soon, what are the consequences you've seen of yeah. not taking care of uh, paying attention closely to some of the ch challenges you're addressing? Right. Well, I think that some of the big issues that I see right now in 
the hospital setting and certainly in clinics are young people that are coming in with issues related to depression, anxiety. We've had a real increase in kids that are coming in, both boys and girls with eating disorders, for example, and um, people that are suicidal, increased use of alcohol and drugs. So those are some of the things that as a pediatrician, I really want to make sure we give kids information on and support them early on before they become bigger problems. But also I have young people that just come in because they have questions about their bodies and the changes and what's happening in puberty and you know how to handle media. And a lot of parents that wanna know how they can create balance when it comes to media use and how they can communicate more effectively. So these are many of the topics that I deal with, with my in my book. And I also say these things don't just start when you turn 12 or 13, they actually having these conversations and these um, important dialogues start much earlier. And mm -hmm. as, as we can start having these relationships, even when the time is that kids are much younger, it really helps as they become teenagers. Yeah. I want to, I have so many friends who have kids in international schools yes. and I want to talk about something, although it's not directly related to this episode, but I think it's important to put out this message. Um, this whole topic, what interested me in your speaking engagement, you often talk about drugs and alcohol, which is it'll still a bit of a taboo. And I've seen that happening a lot in all schools, obviously, but I don't because we're exposed to international schools where it's kind of even a bigger taboo, I have the feeling, and almost normalized, like it's normal because they're teens or you just have to deal with it. Like, mm. so what is your take on that? And how do you help parents? Uh, what, what, how can parents deal with this? Well, I, I think one of the ways that I address this both with teenagers and also with parents is that I talk about the teen brain and I say, mm -hmm. it's all about the brain and the teen brain doesn't fully uh, finish developing until you're about 25 years of age. So it starts sometime from when you're 11, 12, and goes all the way into your mid 20s. And so for parents that think they have an 18 or 19 year old that's off in university and that their child is fully developed, I think, again, they need to realize there's a lot of development and growing that's still occurring. And what I say is that all of those connections that are happening in the brain in terms of making decisions and thinking about consequences and um, again, sometimes being able to handle uh, what's happening around them isn't fully set until later in life. And what's really important when you're an adolescent is trying and testing and experimenting. The limbic system is much more active um, in, in the adolescent time period. So accepting that as parents and knowing that a normal part of adolescence is trying things out Um, and if they don't try things out, they're never going to learn for themselves is one piece of it. Mm. But the second part is that when the brain is developing, it's also at a higher risk for being vulnerable to things like being chronically stressed or restrictive eating, or even a couple episodes of binge drinking. There can be little changes that occur in the brain. And what we also know is if you start smoking, for example, before the age of 15 or so, or 14, that you're more likely to stay addicted because your brain is more vulnerable at that age and it's harder for you to stop. And the folks that have created um, vaping products, for example, know that because they tailor it to young people and make it exciting for young people because they know that once you're 14 or 15 and you start vaping, you're probably going to be hooked for life. And so I say it's all about the brain and understanding the brain when it comes to things like alcohol and drugs. And part of what we know is that kids are going to try because they're curious and that's normal. But the other piece of it is we need to tell them that because their brains are developing, that we need to also support them in terms of making sure their brains stay healthy because they only have one brain. Mm -hmm. And um, trying to, again, help them to defer some of these activities, help them to address peer pressure when their friends are pushing them to do it being there if they do sometimes try things out to be a support for them in case they do make a mistake and kind of helping them also talking about what your own morals and values are because sometimes that's very different culturally than what might be happening in the larger culture around you these are all really important things that we as parents and, and caregivers need to think about when we're addressing kids that are again thinking about alcohol and drug use It's an interesting balance and I find very difficult task to find between letting those kids experiment right. versus making sure that they don't experiment too far that it becomes like it stays for the future, the consequences. So what is it that uh, parents can find inside your book to help them with this? I will just say that each chapter starts with questions that teenagers have asked me. 
-hmm. and um, also questions that parents have asked me. And in fact, the book is very much based on a survey that I did of about 250 uh, teens and parents around the country and some of the big issues that they have been struggling with. But in addition to that, I did focus groups with teenagers and with parents to get some of these really important questions. So each chapter starts with questions, and then continues on with a short, um, a little piece about a story from either a teen patient of mine, my own experience as an adolescent, my experience as a parent. Um, and then it goes on into, again, some very specific tips and strategies uh, to address um, a topic or an issue. And then it ends with the answers to the questions um, from both the teenagers and the parents, as well as resources that um, parents can tap into further. So I tell people that are busy that this book is meant to just dip in and out of. You can just read a chapter at a time. You don't need to read it from beginning to end. It's meant for, again, busy parents that don't have a very long attention span. And if you don't have much time at all, just go to the end of each chapter where all the answers to the questions are to get a really quick uh, idea of what's going on. I will also add that even though this is meant for adults and for parents, I've heard that um, sometimes teenagers are picking up the book themselves and the book has kind of mysteriously moved around in a household. And I love that because it means that kids are also reading it. And this is just a wonderful way to start having conversations. Wow, I love that. This is amazing <laughs> uh, that it, it managed to travel into the hands of the, the kids themselves. I think um, I'm just very inspired, I don't know, um, by the this generation of TCK. I think they are much more aware of their challenges and willing to actually find the resources. Uh, I'm very impressed with that. I don't know if you agree with. Yes. I mean, I, I'm such a, a huge <laughs> fan of uh, our current generation of young people and I'm always learning from them, but I think they're so hopeful and so resourceful. So yeah. absolutely agree. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anisha. It's been amazing to um, to go through your journey and, and you've been amazing at sharing really, really like super helpful and, and valuable tips here for those who are in this journey as well. Is there anything you'd like to share before we say goodbye for those who are in this journey of either writing a book or bringing to the world something that means something important that can make an impact, but still feeling either fearful, hesitant, or not knowing where to start? I would just say that you need to believe in yourself and to uh, get that team, get those people that believe in you um, to be by your side, um, have accountability partners and um, start early. If you're going to create a product like this, you know, it's never too early to start in terms of getting the word out and getting others. And at the end of the day, use your global village. I mean, I think the beauty of um, our, our networks is that there's so many people that have skill sets that can support us. We don't need to do this by ourselves. Reach out um, and make sure you're using others um, to, to be able to get through this. It is so true. Thank you for that great reminder. And where's the best place to find you? I can be reached on my website, which is dranishaabraham.com. I'm on Instagram and that's Dr. Underscore Anisha. And I'm also on LinkedIn. And if folks want to sign up for my newsletter, they can go to my website as well. Wonderful. And of so, course, my book is on Amazon and yes. Walmart and uh, Barnes and Nobles and a number of other book uh, handlers around the world. Excellent. Nomad Nation, find all these resources on the show notes of this episode, tandemnomads.com slash 210. And thank you again, Anisha. I look forward to continue to follow your journey. Thank you. Of course. And Nomad Nation, meet you in the next episode. In the meantime, stay tuned to turn your challenges into great opportunities.